Hi, it's Elizabeth Stewart. Welcome to my house. And we, this is the Calabasas Antiques Roadshow. And because I thought you might like to see some of my things, maybe you've got similar things. And what I'd like to do is give you a little tour of the house and then select maybe six to eight things that maybe you'd like to see that I own. And then we have a, we'll have a chance afterwards to do a little discussion about those things and your things. So first of all, you're seeing me in front of a painting. And this painting is particularly interesting to me because I love, there, come here, there. I love little dogs. And you see the little dog here. In a minute, you'll see my dog, hopefully. I also love horses and I also love harlequins. And so this painting says a lot to me, especially because this figure looks a lot like my son. So what is it? How do you look at a painting? And the important things, oh, there he is. Here he is. <laughs> How do you look at a painting? Uh, and what do you see in a painting that makes you like it? We already talked about some of the features that images appeal to me. But what is it in a composition in a painting that actually makes your eyes stay in a painting? So first of all, we'll look, let's look at this painting. When we get on with the tour of my house, we're going to also look at some silver. We're going to look at some porcelain. We'll look at we'll look at other pieces of what we call objet de art. I've got a pair of wonderful candlesticks I want to show you. So first of all, paintings. How do you see a painting? Well, let me show you what what composition should indicate to you when you look at a painting. First of all, composition of a painting should keep you in the painting. So the painting should actually move your own eye through the painting. And as you see here, there are certain lines and certain indicators in this painting that make your eye move around the painting. First of all, there's the line of the horse's back. There's the line also continuing around of him nuzz nuzzling the dog carries up to the body of the horse here and into the eyes of the figure. So that is the composition that keeps your eye moving around. You're looking for elements in the painting to show you and to indicate to you what the artist thought was important. I find it really interesting, too, that there's certain historical periods where the painting kind of comes alive for certain, I don't know, certain times in history. And I bet you can look at this and say, ah, that painting looks straight out of the 1950s. And indeed it is, because there was a cult at that time of the Harlequin. And if you can remember, that was made very popular by Picasso, the Harlequins that he did, and all the Harlequins that followed. There's even this tradition in the 1950s of the pair of lamps. You have a Harlequin and a female harlequin. You have a punch, you have a Judy, you have these lamps where you have figures. That was a very 50s thing to do. So by the image, we can identify the date. We already talked about the circular composition of this piece, how it moves around. And also, the way that it's painted. So if you can hear that, the little tapping, what we're looking for is what's the medium, what's the support? And the support in this case is a board. So this painting weighs a ton, and it, it actually gives a, a sort of a matte quality, a flat matte quality to the paint as it's laid on the surface. The artist is named Vertes, and he was a French um, a semi-important artist in, in the 1950s and the 1960s. I bought this painting for, as you will see in my house, for very little money because I tend to go to thrift stores and garage sales and estate sales, and I tend to buy things for nothing. But I tend to know what I'm buying because I'm looking for what you just heard me talk to you about, the composition, and I'm looking for the, for the, um, the theme, and I'm looking also for the date. And you can usually tell the date by the way it's painted. You know, while we're on the subject of paintings, maybe we should look at another painting. So this is another painting in my house, and if you notice, I have a little house, but I like big paintings. And this is particularly interesting when we talk about the theme and also the composition. So we'll talk a little bit about 
what is the theme? Well, the theme is industry, and it's usually uh, sort of, you can kind of get a sense that it's probably at a period when industry was celebrated, and what I'm talking specifically about is the WPA Artist Project. So we're talking about, you know, after the Great Depression, uh, the WPA was formed so that artists could do murals. And I have a suspicion that this is uh, from an old wall of an old building somewhere. And why I say that is because it is on drywall. Uh, the paint's on drywall, and so I, I feel like this was taken from a wall. Also, you see the painting was done in panels. So this is the first panel, the second panel the next panel down, and I think the artist painted it and then rolled it on the wall. So I bought a piece of a wall from the thrift store in Ventura, and this is it. What does it celebrate? Well, we talked about the farming industry. It looks like they're picking grapes, perhaps, or some kind of fruit, you know? And then the interesting thing, why I really like it, is the perspective. So when we talk about art, what are we looking at, and whose eyes are we looking through? So we're looking through our eyes, but we're also looking through the eyes of the artist. Where are the artist's eyes in this case? Well, the artist's eyes are way back here, and the, the sight line goes like this, straight down. You see that parallel line? It goes down. So the artist is looking from a vantage point of on high and sort of telescoping down. Our eyes, of course, are right in front of the painting, so we're not seeing that from the artist's eyes, but he's indicating that by the perspective. It's emphasized here, that perspective, because of all the rows of the field and the um, treatment of the hills, the treatment of the vines. So it's almost like he's used a wide angle lens and he's scoped it out like this so that we get a sense of going right into this off center of the painting. There's some accent pieces, you know, the whites of the uh, gentlemen's shirts. There's the accents of the red roofs, typical of California. We don't know who the artist is, but I really liked it because I thought it was such an interesting piece. And also, the challenge was, the challenge was to actually figure out what it was, who did it, and where it was. And as a matter of fact, since you're all Californians listening to me, this is right outside of San Luis Obispo. I was able to identify this mountain, and there are farms like this right around in the mountain valley. 1930s, um, 1940s, uh, WPA painting on a big piece of wall. So let's look at a pair of candlesticks next. We did two paintings. We'll look at a pair of candlesticks. Okay. So we look at, at these candlesticks right here, and these are ecclesiastical candlesticks. When we say ecclesiastical, I mean that these are from a church. So they're from an altar of a church somewhere. I bought these from, um, what do they call it, like a street fair? Uh, a street fair where you know people were, have booths and selling things from their booths. And I just, it appealed to me. I think they were under $50 the pair, and I just thought, I, I really love these. Well, what are they? Let's talk about the medium itself. These are bronze. Bronze is a combination of brass and other metals. Bronze has been around for a long, long time. Bronze is responsible for sculpture, for statuary, also for things like these candlesticks. And bronze is usually cast. So the idea is that this is a cast piece. The decoration itself was in the casting. And um, what, is it, what is the theme of this? Well, the theme is we associate the Gothic movement with churches. And that happened right at the middle of the 19th century where an architect named Pugin, P-U-G-I-N, um, wrote books on the proper architecture for churches. And he suggested that everything about a church, the architecture, the um, objects to art in the church, should all reference the Gothic. Because in his opinion, that was the highest point of the religious uh, feeling of the whole world at the time. So these are Gothic, in the Gothic style. They're not from the Gothic era, of course. These are probably 
late 19th, early 20th century, but they're in the Gothic style. I just think they're beautiful. Um, like we said, the idea is that, well, they're bronze, they're heavy, they're interesting, they have a great shape, and they also evoke a certain period. They evoke the Gothic revival period in the late 19th century. Should we do a piece of maybe porcelain next? So this is my china cabinet in my living room, I guess you could say. It's sort of it's a condo I live in, and it's a living room, dining room situation. And I found this case at a thrift store, and everything that's in the case is also from thrift stores. And I thought I'd talk about one particularly notable piece of porcelain, and that's this Chinese bowl. So this is a bowl in the style called Imari. And Imari is an old tradition. It goes back ages in Japan. And then it sort of got its way, imported its way to China, and then back to Japan, back to China, to Korea. All the Asian nations picked up this style of Imari. And Imari is characterized by geometry and a certain idea of perspective and also the colors and the design. So you see you've got blue around the edge that's very much like an Amari blue, deep cobalt glaze. And then here you've got the rooftops of the various little pagodas. The birds are flying over these pagodas. And you'll notice that it has a big crack in, in the center and it divides the piece like this. That doesn't bother me because this is a piece from the 18th century. And when you have a piece of old and big porcelain that's that old, Typically, you don't worry about the flaws because there's an idea in de the decorative arts that if something is very rare, for example, if you go to the British Museum, you'll see the Portland vase. There was only one Portland vase. It's from the Roman period. It's been patched together so many times. But the idea is when it's been patched together, it's an indication that somebody thought it was important. And to me, when I saw that crack, I thought, well, you know, that's interesting. And it also means it's old. And it also means that somebody somewhere thought it was pretty important. And they mended it. You know, they mended it in a really interesting way, too. The way old porcelain was mended in the past was to take two drills, drill on either side of the crack, and put a metal staple in, that, in those holes. And then they heat the staple up. So the staple actually drew the two pieces, the two broken pieces together. So here you have a beautiful Mari bowl. Like I said, this is probably Chinese, but the style is in the Japanese style. And this piece, mm, hard to say the value on this piece, but I would say, you know, we're talking five to eight hundred dollars in the condition that it's in. Beautiful old piece of the Mari. And I've always loved the birds. Another quality of Amari is that it usually has a beautiful gold, real gold, paint on top of the actual blazing. So these little chrysanthemums, which by the way are a symbol of good luck, those chrysanthemums are beautifully painted in gold accents. So while we're in this cabinet, maybe I could tell you a little bit about some other things that are in this cabinet. And maybe I'll get you to think about what's in your china cabinets and we can talk about that at the end of the lecture, which will be, this is a video, but we are going to have the time to talk about what, what's in your china cabinet live. So what's in, what is interesting in here? Well, there's a lot of different periods in time that are represented here. Number one, this is you know, something that's very kind of modern. And the modern period started, you know, back in Germany with the Bauhaus movement. Very linear. It was a, a, a way of expressing lines that was very different from the period before. If you remember the Bauhaus at the beginning of the 20th century, right before that, the late 19th century, very curvilinear. Everything was moving. And remember, we, we talked about these. We talked about the candlesticks at the end of the 19th century. And you see how when you move into the modern period, you get really aggressive, strong lines. The history of the decorative arts always moves between two things. It moves between the curvilinear, like the candlesticks, 
to the very linear, and the pendulum swings back and forth like that. So modern piece here, this is a piece from the 50, uh, 1950s. This is a kind of glass called Murano glass, which is Italian. The island of Murano was known for its glass blowers. I have two pieces here and here of Murano glass. And by the way, that's my favorite color, that very light teal blue. So these are two pieces of Murano glass. How do you know the Murano? Well, Murano is blown in sort of a uh, tripart uh, system. First of all, you can see that there's clear glass and then there's glass that's colored underneath. So first the glass is blown and the colored glass is blown and it kind of comes out of the um, kiln, I guess you could say the hot oven. So the glass maker is blowing through a, a long tube and he's got a gather, it's called the gather by the way, of glass on the end and he's turning that gather and then he sticks that um, colored glass into a solution of molten clear glass and then turns it again. So you get this idea of this glass being cased. So the glass underneath is one color and the overlay glass is another color. Likewise with this. What's interesting about this piece is that there's been bubbles forced into that casing of white molten glass or clear, I should say clear molten glass. So you get this beautiful bubble formation. That's also very typical of Murano. So two pieces of Murano glass here. We have an Asian crackle vase back here. And then this is a piece of very modern, I would say 1970s by the colors. Very modern, um, modern glass. So two pieces of modern glass here, Murano glass. This is a piece of lucite. I happen to love lucite, as a matter of fact. I can show you. Wherever I see a piece of lucite, I buy it, even if it's not attached to anything. So here's a big piece of lucite. I just love the way lucite looks. And can you see the way it catches the light? I love lucite. So, <laughs> you know, I've got lucite um, oh, sticking all over the house. And maybe we can talk about what's hot right now in terms of uh, decorative arts. Well, lucite is hot because it represents a period called mid-century modern. Piece of lucite, lucite sculpture here. Another piece of lucite here. What is here on the second shelf? Well, this is also a lucite sculpture and this is in the shape of a Salvador Dali face. If you know the faces in Salvador Dali's painting, this is a sculpture that's in honor of Salvador Dali. All from thrift stores, I see them and I think, oh, that is amazing. I think this was all of what, $15 or so. It's on a marble plinth. Piece of glass, a mother and child, beautiful piece of blown glass. This is also Italian. By the way, that's St. Barbara. I bought that from, a, believe it or not, from the mission yeah, Santa Barbara Mission, she's holding the, the... Oh, maybe you can see it better if I move this. So there's St. Barbara, and I bought that from um, one of the priests at the mission who likes to make pottery. So that's my St. Barbara. What else is here? This is a piece of glass that's also Murano. Um, I'm attracted to these colors. And I think the way that this, these, this is blown is really interesting. So you have all of the features we talked about with these two Murano pieces. And the way that this is blown is really beautiful because there's little bubbles all through it and little flecks of gold. I bet you've seen that with Murano glass. This is a piece of bone. It's B-O-E-H-M. This is porcelain and this is a jaybird. It's in honor of my mother who collected bone birds all her life. And I saw that at a thrift store. And by the way, we talked about items that had been damaged. This was in the thrift store because he was missing one foot. And the one foot was kind of on a little envelope attached to one of his wings. And I thought, I bet you I can fix that. So I rigged up a system and I glued his foot back on and God willing it stays. This has been a couple of years, so probably it will. These are interesting because they're beautiful works of art 
but right now they're not worth all that much. Um, if you talk to me about, wow, well, Elizabeth, what's worth something in this case? I would say probably the art glass, the Murano glass. I think the Murano glass is probably what's most valuable in this case right now in the, in the present market. Who knows, maybe the birds will resurface. These are two um, pieces in marble, and these are female torsos in marble. Uh, I bought these from the late comedian Jonathan Winters from his sale that um, I had the privilege of appraising everything in his household. So we bought those from Jonathan Winters sale. This is also a piece of modern glass. It's in the style of the Bauhaus. This probably dates from the 20s. Oh, maybe I'd maybe like to see that a little better. So the idea with the very modern glass is that in the, in the beginning of the 19th century, there were two eras. And the one era was called Art Deco, and the other was Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau predated Art Deco. This is an Art Deco piece. And you can see, very deco. You know what that shape is. It's linear, it's angular, and this is a piece of German art deco. It's not necessarily a good piece of glass, but I love it because I love the idea of the deco, having a, a nice piece of deco glass. You know, when people look at me, they say, well, how do you know it's really old? How do you know that this dates from the beginning of the 20th century? How do you know? Well, I can tell by the, sh by the design, but you can also, let me how I can say this, old things look old. And when I say that, I don't know, can, can you get a sense of the bottom? Can you see that? Can you see all the wear? So even glass will show wear. Even glass will show wear. So you think, well, it's, is, is it reproduction or is it old? That much scratching could only be through many years. So an Art Deco piece of glass in my collection here. Another piece of Murano, this one, and another piece of Murano back there. This is also from that potter who likes California themes. It's a, can you see that? It's a California bear. My two uh, sculptures, this is also Murano. And then we have a piece here, I don't know, let's see. Maybe you've got a piece like this in your house, this piece of Murano here. Maybe you've got a piece like this in your house. This is a Lalique piece. Can you see that? So Lalique glass, you know, people say to me, well, I have a piece of Lalique, how do I know it's valuable? I will tell you exactly. The earlier the pieces in, of Lilique are, the more valuable they are. So this is an earlier piece, you can kind of tell. It's not quite as clear as the later pieces. When I say clear, it's got a grayer tone. So it's an earlier piece of old Lilique. I think you'll be interested to know, I think that was probably all of $10 at an estate sale. I don't think anybody really knew what it was. So anyway, we kind of covered, maybe, can we see up on top? Up on top of the case, there's a couple of interesting pieces. The two blue vases there are ceramic. That's stoneware and that's porcelain. So the teal is, is porcelain and then the darker vase is stoneware. They're both Asian and I don't know how old they are. The interesting thing about Asian material is it's classic. When I say classic, that means the same forms have been done for thousands of years. And so there's no telling, really, the date of a, of a piece of Asian ceramic, except by the wear and except by the glazing. And even the glazes are classic. If you can look, that stoneware piece could be thousands of years old, or it could have been made last week. They, have, they stick with the same form that's why Asian material is so, so challenging to date. Up here we've got Portuguese, uh, Portuguese ceramics. These are not porcelain. These are glazed, the birds, the toucan and the um, parrot. No, those are glazed with color. And that's in the style of the Portuguese majolica. 
Majalica is a style, and it's it, it was it centered around Portugal and Italy, and also made its way into France. Those are Portuguese. On the end, this is a, a barrel shape, which is Chinese. Uh, Chinese figures um, of flowers and grass. This is in a style called famille vert, vert meaning French for green, and famille vert, vert is a famous style of Chinese export porcelain. Chinese export porcelain, what was it? Well, when people came with boats full of tea, they needed something to hold down the weight of the boat, and so people started to, to export porcelain from China as a ballast. Well, it caught on because porcelain was not known in Europe. We couldn't make it. Uh, we didn't know the chemical composition and we didn't know the magic ingredient, which is called kaolin. And kaolin is a beautiful um, mineral that's found in certain areas of the world. Without kaolin, you can't have porcelain. Well, China had a bunch of kaolin, and so they discovered the chemical composition of porcelain very early on. So this is Chinese export porcelain, must have come over in the ballast of some ship in the 18th century. You might say to me, Elizabeth, where did you find that, okay? That was a lamp base and somebody had drilled through the bottom uh, to wire a lamp. The interesting thing is, when you go, I don't know, thrift store, uh, you go antiquing, you look for things, look at the lamps. Why do I say that? Because many times with antique lamps, when electricity started to happen in, in, in the world, People would take the most valuable vase they had in the house because to have a light in your living room was a big focus of attention. So they take a vase that was very valuable and they drill it and they turn it into a lamp and that lamp was like the center of their pride and joy. So a lot of times you get very, very valuable pieces of porcelain that have been drilled in the 1920s to make lamps. So I think we did this china cabinet. We kind of got a tour of what else is in the china cabinet. Um, oh, let's take a look here. Uh, let's put our nude back. In the bottom of the china cabinet, I have more pieces of glass. Can you see that? I love glass. I have a lot of different um, Italian pieces of glass, colored glass, this is called threaded glass. So maybe what we can do, oh, can you see that? So a lot of different pieces of glass uh, that I have collected from thrift stores over the years. The one exception, of course, is maybe this piece, which is Rosenthal. And Rosenthal is a beautiful china that's actually made in the 1950s, 1960s in um, Germany. And I happen to love Rosenthal. Again, I love the colors of this. So uh, a number of glass pieces and porcelain pieces for flower arranging in my china cabinet. I think what we can do next is we can look at a piece of antique textile. And let's see, where shall we, where shall we go to look at a piece of antique textile? I have it right here. Maybe you'd like to see it against some antique books. And we can talk about the antique books later. So, we'll close up the china cabinet for now. Uh, and we'll take a look at a piece of, we'll take a look at an antique fan. So this is an antique fan. <clears throat> this is a fan that was painted and appliqued on silk. Um, if you can see, there's these two figures, and the figures are riding in a cart, and the cart itself is outlined in little sequins, and this is the horse here, there's a lady and a gentleman, and you can see the gentleman has this very interesting hat. What is that hat? Well, that hat indicates the age of the fan, alongside the fact that it's a very old-looking piece. 
and it's aged over the years. That silk has kind of the glue that was used to place the silk on the paper has aged the silk. I think at one time this was probably a very bright green uh, silk, but it's aged over time. His hat is indicative of something very interesting because it has this upturned brim and a high uh, crest to it. That is a hat that's typical of the Regency period. When you talk about the Regency period, you're talking about Jane Austen. Does that make sense to you? So the outfits of Jane Austen's characters, this is what they would have been wearing, uh, that kind of a hat. She has an interesting thing. She has a feature of pearls around her hair and uh, that's all picked out in these very, very fine sequins. When you look at this and you say, sequins, uh, what are sequins? Well, <laughs> right now, if you have a sequin dress or a gown, the sequins are um, not organic, but in the 18th century where this dates from, all sequins were organic. They were made from tortoise shell, or in this case, they were made from real gold and real silver. So the sequins are little bit dots, 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 dots of real gold and silver that accents the fan. Now, there's an interesting thing about fans. I don't know if uh, you know what fans were used for, but just an interesting sideline. And this to me is a really interesting thing about collecting because you know, when you collect something, you also collect a piece of history, and you collect the form of the history, and what I mean by that is, what did fans do? Well, women used fans when they couldn't say what they were thinking. So let's say there's a handsome man, and you're in a play, and you're in the, in the balcony, and you're looking over, and there's a very handsome man. You can actually make the movements with your fan, to indicate, I'd like to see you, or I think you're attractive. There were different ways you held the fan, or folded the fan, uh, or, or shielded your face, or didn't shield your face. That was called the language of the fan. So this indicates a period in history where, who knows, who knows what woman used this? Who knows what she was saying with this fan at any given point? I will tell you though, this is so interesting to me because there's, the faces have been applied. So their little faces are appliqued onto the silk. What, why is that important? It's important because the faces are little portraits. They're very specific. They're not generic faces. They look like a real person would look. And I have a feeling that because the man is holding the woman quite boldly around the waist, and she's actually also holding him around the waist. And it's a very loving couple. I think the fan was commissioned. I think he commissioned this fan for the lady in, in, in the carriage. So that's an 18th century fan. Yeah, what's it worth? I would say probably to a fan collector, and there are collectors of fans out there, maybe four to 500, something like that. So perhaps we could do, what do you think we should do? Let's do, let's, when we come back, let's do a tea box. We'll do an 18th century, since we're on the 18th century, we'll talk a little bit about 18th century. We'll talk a little bit about a tea box when we get back. Um. So this is an 18th century tea box, and you'll say, well, I'd like to see what's inside. Do you know I've had this for over 20 years? I bought this when I was in the ballet company at, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it was a time in Pittsburgh where all the oil money was kind of losing their money, I should say. And uh, this was from an estate sale of a very famous oil financier. And it happened to be, you know, inexpensive. I think it was probably, you know, um, under $50 if I remember. But the idea is, um, it appealed to me for various reasons. But I've never been able to get inside because <laughs> This is not the right key and it won't open. So I don't know, I can't show you what's inside. It's always been a little mystery. One day I'm gonna have a locksmith open it and we can take a look. I know it's a tea box because it's all the famous watering holes of Europe in the 18th century. So this is uh, the place of the sea and this is a, a place in uh, France. There's a place here, um, 
I think in Germany, all these are watering holes. So when I say watering holes, that means where people would get together and take the baths. That's a famous place in Bath, England, for example, where the natural hot springs came up. That was the most beautiful water. People would bathe in it, they'd drink it, and also it was the basis for a really good cup of tea. This is a Vauxhall spa in England. Uh, all these are spas. So if you go around the box, you look at all the different spas. The interior, I can tell you, I know what it must look like. And the interior, because of the way the box is made, there's three sections. There's three tea boxes in here for sure. I can hear them rattling. <laughs> and those tea boxes would be made out of tin and they've been, they would have been painted in the same style. What is the style? The style is called Griselle. Griselle is done where it's um, monochromatic. So it's, Griselle means that it's white and all colors of grays and blacks, no color. And this was a very famous style in the 18th century to make something monochromatic to make it Griselle. The tea boxes inside will be Griselle like this they will be painted on tin. The way of painting on tin, there's a name for that, it's called toll. And toll painting, paint on tin, also in this Griselle style. One, two, three tea boxes inside. Little tea box on, on little feet. It would have been a, in a place of honor in the 18th century. You would have opened the box and you would have selected the tea from the various tins. It could be different tea, it could be a dark tea, it could be a, a green tea, etc. So you have a choice. You know, the host would say, what would you like? Make your tea, it was, a, it was a ceremony. So this is a little tea box from the 18th century, and you'll see the top. The top has a very interesting allegorical painting. The allegory is love. Okay, how do I know this? Well, here's the shepherdess and her sheep. Here's two lovers, and what's happening here is that the sheep is sign of docility, here's a dog sign of fidelity, and the, the woman is reaching over and she's opening the side of a birdcage. That's an allegory of love. That means I'm setting something free. And usually the birdcage would be immediately recognized by the 18th century as an allegory of love. And so there's the young lover, she's opening a birdcage, and here's the shepherdess representing nature, who's sort of seeing over the beautiful young lovers as they open a birdcage. This would have been a point of conversation for people as they were drinking their tea in the 18th century. Shall we see a piece of silver? Let's look at a piece of silver. These are two stirrups. Yes, they are stirrups. And what that means is, these were for ladies to use as they rode. Here's where the uh, leather strap would attach. Here's where your little feet would go. And so these are little stirrups. These are probably Spanish. And they are silver, but they're not sterling. So what is silver if it's not sterling? Well, let's give you an example. Sterling is and by the way, this is a sterling cuff. Here you see a mission and a senorita and a cart. This is a cuff was on your, your wrist like this. This is a piece of sterling. That means it's 925 parts silver in a thousand pieces of base metal. So it has more silver than, than any other type of, um, uh, of, of silver. It goes down now in gradient. It'll go down to 800 parts over 1,000. It'll go down to seven, 600, et cetera. These are probably very low on the totem pole of silver. There's not a lot of silver in this metal. This is probably 400 over 1,000, something like that. These little stirrups, um, probably, like I said, Portuguese or Spanish. Um, where do they date from? They're probably 19th century. Some of these stirrups um, like this, you'll see in brass, you'll see them in bronze, and these are in a kind of silver. We don't know what. The value of, oh, we didn't talk about the value of the tea box. I would say about $1,000 for the tea box. 
if inside we find it has its beautiful little toll tea boxes, tins inside, maybe more. Um, these people do collect, and I would say that these are probably worth about $200, $300. Not a lot of silver in these. And this cuff, Mexican silver, probably very high level of, of silver in, silver content in it. How do you know that? Well, can you see how it flexes? So silver is very soft, it's very malleable. And so you can usually tell silver, sterling, uh, by the softness of it. And you can feel it too. It'll feel kind of buttery and soft. Whereas these are cold and harder. So you can always tell uh, the content of silver by a really interesting test I like to do. So if you can bear with me, there's a part of your body that is very sensitive to heat and to the conductivity of heat, and that's your face. So I always hold a piece of silver to my face. If I feel it's warming up very quickly, I know there's probably a lot of silver content in the silver. So this is a beautiful old cuff, Spanish, but I think it's uh, Spanish colonial, so I think it's probably from South America. I would even venture to say probably Peruvian, just by the de decoration. Spanish colonial has a very Baroque look, so there's a lot of action, there's a lot of movement. The Baroque per period is characterized by big, bold curves. So you have Baroque architecture, and then it kind of filters down to Baroque silver. You'll see these big curving lines, and that's a Baroque feature.